All right, can everybody hear? All right. Well, uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the East Hampton Library and the Tom Toomey Lecture Series. Uh, today we're talking about uh, craft brewing on the east end of Long Island. And with me today we have Vaughn Cotillo of Montauk Brew Co. Next to him we have Lori Spitz of Mustache Brewing in Riverhead. And at the end we have Rich Vandenberg from Greenport Harbor Brewing in Greenport. And uh, yeah. And I, I'd like to thank you guys in advance for spending, taking time out of your day to come and talk to all of us about your uh, great beer. So Pleasure. why don't we get started? Uh, so you're all from the East End, obviously, but, you know, how, since it's such a great place out here, how do you guys stay connected to like, local neighborhoods and, like, from each of your respective neighborhoods? Like, what do you do to be involved with the neighborhood and the local economy and everything like that? Sure. First off, thanks for having me. Uh, Vaughn from Montauk Brewing Company. Uh, honored to be here. Um, you know, when we were kind of, we started home brewing in my basement uh, after college, uh, myself and two uh, locals, Eric Moss and Joe Sullivan, and um, you know, when we realized we were kind of onto something a little bigger than hobby brewing, we realized that we really wanted to connect with the community that uh, kind of embraced us. We're from the community, um, so we wanted to use the space more than a bar, more than uh, something had been done, uh, or something hadn't been done like this in Montauk um, until we came around. So we wanted to use the space for fundraising events. We raise a lot of money for charities um, and really connect with the community. We don't have a TV by design. We want to be more of a meeting place. Um, you know, young families come in. Um, you know, it's just a fun place and it's a little different. So it allowed us to, um, you know, to your point, to really connect with uh, the locals. I mean, we're open year round as well. Um, a lot of the businesses um, shut down uh, during the winter. I live about a mile from the brewery, so uh, you know I work. Uh, it's kind of turned into a thing where I work the tap room uh, Thanksgiving Day for a couple hours and Christmas Day. You know, it's just kind of a nod to the community for embracing us, um, and that's kind of helped us grow uh, outside of Montauk. Lori, if you want to. Hey. So again, like Juan said, thank you so much for coming out tonight. I know it's Friday night, right on the East End. Um, so yeah, but um, so. Uh, mustache Brewing is actually, I'm one half of it, the other uh, half is my husband Matthew who is not here. Uh, he is actually the mustache half, I'd like to just put that on the record. We get a lot of confusion about that. Um, I'm actually getting my mustache waxed again next week. So I figured I'd just put that out there, it's usually the first burning question that everybody has for us. So Matt and I are actually not East End natives. Um, so we're up islanders as a term that we learned when we moved out here about five years ago. Uh, we grew up in East Islip, uh, high school sweethearts. And um, when we were actually looking to start our brewery, um, kind of the same, I think we're probably all in the same camp of like home brewers that just got really excited one day and thought this is an awesome idea. <laughs> Um, so we had actually intended to be closer to the city. That was a place that really resonated with us for a very long time. We had plans on moving westward. Um, long story short, didn't work out. Uh, last place we were actually thinking was the East End because being an up islander, we're like, oh my god, it's like the sticks out there, you know? Because you don't know. You come out here like once a year, you go pumpkin picking, you call it a day. <laughs> Listen, we all know it's the truth, right? So, you know. We're looking, we're looking, and uh, friends of ours, uh, Dan and Greg, out Long Ireland, we had stopped there on Black Friday to pick up our Black Friday bottles. And uh, they're like, oh, what are you guys looking out here? We're like, well, should we be? <laughs> like, at this point, you know, we're just really lost. We don't know what we're looking for, where we're going. Um, so long story short, we got connect. We got put, I left Long Ireland, my phone rings, and I pull over, because it's Dan, and I'm like, did I leave something? And as it turns out, the town supervisor of Riverhead stopped in to pick up his keg for the week um, and was like, he wants to meet you. So I'm like, all right, turn around, go back. And he's like, well, I heard there's another brewery coming to town. And we're like, wait, what? I'm like, what did you tell them? So long story short, Riverhead totally embraced having another brewery in town, which was not something we were met with from pretty much any other town up island. Everyone's like, oh, this is a bar, this is going to be a thing. And I'm like, no, 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 like, this is definitely not going to be a bar. It's still like tasting room, we're, you know, kind of like what the wineries do. Nobody under really, really understood what that meant. So Riverhead totally ran with it, which is amazing, um, and have been super supportive. Um, and really, you know, we've seen, you know, um, such a resurgence in Riverhead in the five years that we've lived there, um, you know, and it's crazy. So for us, the, the locals and the town embracing us, we really just were like, we have to find ways to give back and help. And I think, you know, this is a pretty constant sentiment across 
you know, a lot of breweries is being part of your community, being a community space. You know, it's not a bar. You know, there's plenty of other bars to go to if you want to watch football or, you know, the news. Um, but yeah, so for us, you know, we we host a lot of different educational events. Um, last night we actually hosted the surf. Let's say Friday. Yeah, that was last night. Um, we hosted the East End chapter of the Surf Rider Foundation to talk about what they're doing for the environment because the environment's a very um, important cause to us. You know, beer comes from water and kind of needs to protect that. So for us, giving back is a huge part of that. Letting you know different community groups do events and talks. Um, and you know, we actually just signed on in April. We're members now of One Percent for the Planet, which means one percent of our sales from our um, New York State licensed beers go back to environmental charities. And we are specifically focusing our giving on local charities. We could give to any number of charities, but it's important to take care of what's immediately around us. So that's a huge, huge thing for us. That's great. Thanks, Lori. And then what about you, Rich? So um, again, echoing thank you for having us. It's a pleasure to be here on the South Fork from the North Fork. Um, uh, so we opened our brewery back in 2009 with uh, my best friend John Legey and I. We met in college 35 years ago, um, and the other day we were recollecting how funny it is that we've actually had a longer relationship that I've been married for 26 years with, uh, with my partner John Legey. So we opened up our brewery in uh, Greenport Village uh, in an old firehouse that was basically falling down. Um, but John and I um, uh, bought the firehouse back at the peak of the economic uh, real estate, you know, height of the market. And the day we closed was the day that Shearson Lehman went bankrupt. So we heard sirens in the street. So we were quickly signing the loan documents and, uh, you know, bought the building, renovated it ourselves. It was a small, about 3,200 square foot building. Um, we started brewing beer there. Uh, self-distributed out of the back of my wife's car. Um, she would go around and convince bartenders at local bars to actually unload the keg out of her car and put it on tap. From there, we kind of grew to a point where um, we needed more production space. And so we actually wound up buying a second uh, location up in Peconic, seven miles up the road. Well, that was an old car dealership that was built back in 1927. It's about a three acre parcel. Um, has a large field, beer garden. We've opened a restaurant last year, um, and we have a, a much larger production facility in Peconic. We brew in both locations still, um, and we're up to 15 employees uh, locally, as well as 12 employees in the restaurant kitchen. So it's been a pretty amazing ride. We've now just celebrated our ninth year uh, as of July 12th. Um, John and I never ever thought it would grow to this level of you know um, what we're doing, uh, but he and I both ultimately uh, or originally were completely committed to local. And your question about you know what what connects us to local uh, for us is extremely important. Um, similar to Lori's you know story as well as uh, Vaughn's about you know making sure that we're connected to local is hugely important to us. We have a program that's called the Giving Tank, and um, it's a metaphorical idea of, we have three pillars, general pillars of a, a charity, and that is to support uh, local and kids and things that help fight cancer. Because both John and I lost our moms to cancer at relatively uh, younger ages. Um, and so, We've actually, in addition to those pillars that kind of define what our, what our um, connection to local is, we also have supported probably about 400 different charities uh, that are in the surrounding area as well. Um, you know, we have events at the brewery as well that I don't know if anybody's seen our dog dock diving event. We have a, a huge festival where you can sign your dog up to see how far it'll jump off a dock into a 27,000 gallon foot a uh, gallon pool on our property, and uh, that money goes to the Guide Dog Foundation, um, money we raise there. So being local is really, really important to us. We, um, we're totally committed to it as well, and it it's just seems like it's the natural right thing to do, and I, I pay a lot of that to my parents as well. I, I mean, I know as a local, I appreciate Vaughn and what he makes, because it's always fun to go there, and I haven't gotten a chance to go to your other places, but I would love to go there soon. But 
Um, and Lori just kind of touched on this about the environment and what they do. And I was wondering what the other, uh, what Vaughn and Rich, what do you, what do you like, how do you, because obviously the East End of Long Island is a beautiful place and that's what brings everybody out here is the beautiful water and the beaches and, and the woods and everything. What do you guys do to try to mitigate your, you know, your carbon footprint, your, just your impact on the uh, environment? Yeah, sure. So obviously, you know, as Lori said, the ocean is just a huge part of our lives kind of growing up on the East End. Um, when we started canning our beers, uh, we only do draft and cans, um, and we had those terrible plastic rings for about a year. Um, we weren't happy about it. We were looking for solutions to kind of uh, do something different. We did that for about a year and then made the decision to actually invest more money. Uh, it cost us more, but it was the right thing to do to ditch the plastic rings and go with uh, a cardboard carton. So they were individually packed six packs. They function really well. They can, you know, you can cart garbage off the beach in them. Um, so we ditched the, you know, those rings. That was a big part of what we were doing. Uh, this summer, um, you know, I actually brought some of the tasting glasses that we use. We try to use glass uh, in the tap room, uh, limit plastic use. Uh, we just um, got some, it's called Hydro Flask is the company, and it's a 16 ounce steel uh, pint glass. And rather than you know use a plastic cup for your pint at the, the brewery, we give a discounted. You buy that, and then you know as long as you have that pint, you come back, and you get discounted pints. It was a small thing, you know. We're not doing these huge measures, but I think it's every little bit kind of helps, um, you know. And just really focus every single day on you know we sit with our whole staff and say, you know, what are we doing right now? How can we get better? How can we you know improve? Um, Lori, I know, said she sponsored the Surfrider Foundation uh, event. Um, we do have the East End chapter out in Montauk a bunch. Um, and really try to focus on new and innovative ways to, um, to really just preserve the environment um, and donate to, you know, CCOM, you know, Concerned Citizens of Montauk, um, for a lot of different, you know, research into uh, environmental, you know, we're right by Fort Pond and, you know, obviously there's some issues there. We want to really make sure that people are paying attention to it and the brewery has allowed us to put eyes um, on some certain issues that, you know, maybe a lot of people uh, weren't thinking about for a while. Great, thanks, Vaughn. Uh, what about you? Uh, do you guys have any in particular things that you do? I mean, I, I can say that we're, we're actually... Um, uh, equally concerned, and it's funny because it seems like we're also I know, playing I surf feel like riders. We're also saying like, uh, the same thing. <laughs> yeah, we, we sponsor surf riders as well on the North Fork. We actually um, they have beach cleanups, and so we work with them to say if you sign up for the beach cleanup, you get to come down to the brewery and you get a free beer after you've cleaned up the beach. So it kind of helps motivate to get people out. The other day we did a big, uh, or, or the a number of months ago we did a big beach cleanup up in Greenport. 67 steps beach and uh, collected almost four tons of trash. They were showing and there that was, last night. And, and uh, it was amazing how much garbage was cleaned up from the uh, uh, Long Island Sound Beach along Greenport. And it was awesome because then everybody came down to the brewery in Greenport afterwards. And, uh, you know, we had a kind of a post party, which we were all ready for after four hours, five hours of cleaning up the beach. But it was great. And, um, we're actually also now implementing other sustainability uh, initiatives, like we're eliminating all our straws. And that beach cleanup for me was a big insight in terms of things that we need to continue to do. So small measures like getting rid of the plastic straws, we're converting over to paper straws, we're eliminating all of our water bottles, we're putting in water fountains in the, in the kitchen and in the brewery, uh, you know, in the restaurant. Um, I've actually um, designed, with the help of uh, this company, a rainwater collection system that we, the size of our brewery in Peconic, a one inch rain, we'll be able to collect 10,000 gallons of water that then we'll be able to use for flushing our toilets, washing down our brewery floors, um, as well as a CO2 system that I gotta share with you guys. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, that is amazing because it's, um, you know, there's a lot of CO2 that goes into the uh, creation of beer uh, in preparation uh, for bottling and canning and, and, and packaging. And there's CO2 reclamation systems that we're going to be implementing. So, you know, there are a lot of things that you can do that are specific, that are small measures, but do have kind of an overall impact. And, and we're 100% believers of that as well. Yeah, we're actually, I'm uh, oh, sorry, I just might add a little oh, more. Ahead. So we're actually, um, we, in October, we just took over. Um, we're going to be. We're in the process of quadrupling our um, our space. So we're actually with this expansion. This is actually going to make us 
really environmentally friendly, which we're so proud of, because we've had these nasty fluorescent lights, we've had these horrible toilets that no matter how many times the plumber comes, they run and run and run. So we, you know, this expansion's allowed us to really like revamp our whole tap room and our whole setup and just become environmentally friendly. Um, we're able to finally get rid of all the plastic, which I'm sure we can all agree is like the worst part of this. Um, you know, as of uh, this uh, last month, actually, our 100% of our electricity comes from wind power. Uh, so we're no longer, um, you know, there's no coal power electric running our brewery. It's all wind, which is a huge, huge thing. Um, we didn't have to put in a wind turbine. We're actually just working with a third-party wind farm to make sure that our money goes to support, you know, a smaller wind farm versus supporting, you know, coal and mining and all the other. I can send you guys that info. It's like the easiest yeah. thing. Um, but yeah, there's so many little things that you can do. Uh, you just have to kind of do a little digging and hang out with your friends and drink some beers. <laughs> that's right. The East Hampton Library. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really awesome, guys. Because you know, as someone that grew up here and have you know, have friends and family that'll be here and hopefully here for many more generations. I think anything we can do to, you know, keep this environment as pretty as it is is great. Um, next, I kind of want to know, especially for you, Rich, is, uh, you know, East End of Long Island has always been known in the past for its wineries and vineyards and different, uh, you know, like Wolfer and all of them. And on the North Fork, obviously, there's a ton. Uh, I know you're kind of in the same market, but I don't know. Do you consider them as that competition, or how do you guys interact with the wine market out here? We have a lot of uh, vintners that come in, winemakers that come in, and they actually will purchase a lot of beer, kegs, from us. Because, believe it or not, in the back of the winery, the winemakers are drinking a lot of good beer. <laughs> and so, you know... A lot of the winemakers tell us that there's a lot of good beer that goes into great wine, and we're happy to be a part of that. So <laughs> we, we kind of, uh, when we first opened up, you know, we kind of, you know, tongue-in-cheek said, well, we're a little bit of a, a beer oasis in the land of grapes, you know. And, um, but it, it, it's been a great relationship, and we actually are now on our seventh year of a, uh, and I brought some of that beer with me tonight, a Cuvaison series that we do because... Um, not only do we have these great relationships where, you know, the, the, the winemakers come in and drink our beer after they're done with their day, but we actually will work with a different winery every year in the harvest season, and we'll brew a, a, a beer called the Cuvaison, and it's basically kind of a Belgian or Cezanne style beer that we use unfermented grape juice with and kind of combine what I see as the best of both worlds for us out there, and it's kind of unique you know, beer, and, um, you know, hopefully you guys will give it a shot and try it. But it's a, it's a great relationship out there. I mean, we're as much an agricultural and want to support the agricultural uh, industry around us. So um, we don't see it as a threat at all. Um, we are also a farm brewery uh, in addition to being a microbrewery. So we're all, um, able to serve um, New York farm wine at, the, at our tasting room as well. Um, because we find that there are some people that are real beer lovers, and they may have a friend or a spouse or a mate who might be more interested in a little bit of wine. So we actually satisfied both needs by doing that. That's great. Uh, I, it's not as much wine out on, in Montauk, but I know you, well, Joe, I, you, Joe has a relationship yeah, with. Yeah, you know, well, the fun thing is, you know, we open the tap room. We have people all over the country coming through there on, you know, any given day, and a lot of people from the North Fork come down from all over, and uh, not everybody's a beer drinker. Um, you know, we get a lot of wine drinkers uh, through the tap room. We don't serve wine, but um, the fun part, and I didn't expect it, um, you know, wine drinker, it's all about experience, right? And you really kind of put your nose in the wine, you experience it, you swirl it in your mouth, you kind of really, it's not just drinking, it's enjoying and tasting. Um, and, you know, when you get a wine drinker in who doesn't like IPAs, maybe they don't think they like them, but they will appreciate complexity and they stick their face in the beer and, you know, shut their eyes. And it's more about experiential, uh, you know, an experience for them. Um, that was really cool. I, I didn't expect that. And uh, it goes back to the quality, right? There you can taste certain grains. We're obviously not using grapes in beer, but uh, in, you know, our beers, but um, it's all about, um, really being present in the tap room and understanding the process um, of, you know, it's not just a, a pint of beer in front of you. Uh, it's a, you know, our brewmaster 
um, you know, it's more of a, a chef in a kitchen uh, putting together really high quality ingredients and then sharing it with somebody who actually cares about, you know, the story of the liquid, not just the beer in the glass, um, which is really kind of an enjoyable thing to see in the tap room. Yeah. Laura, you're kind of right in the middle of the North and South Forest. Yeah, so. so I mean, we're definitely right there at the head of the, the wine trail um, and actually the reverse of what Rich said. Uh, behind every brewery is a bunch of kegs of wine as well. <laughs> um, that sediment holds true in our house. So yeah, um, we've actually developed some pretty amazing relationships with all of the, the winemakers on the North Fork. Um, you know, in a lot of the similar ways that Rich said, you know, we do um, a beer during every harvest season that we, really, ugh, excuse me, that we release during the holidays called Champagne Showers. It stemmed from a New Year's Eve of Matt and I sitting at the table being like, oh my God, we want champagne. Are we celebrating with champagne? Are we celebrating with a beer? What are we doing tonight? It's like quarter two. What are, what are we taking out of the fridge? So we did a, a happy marriage of, of the two. So we had something for beer drinkers to celebrate with. But also with that being said, you know, and for us, um, being such a small brewery, when we started, we didn't have a lot of resources of labs and testing equipment. And a lot of the bigger wineries on Long Island have these absolutely phenomenal um, labs where they do a lot of quality control testing. They have machinery that my head brewer dreams about and is asleep at night that I can't afford. But the beauty of it is I have resources of people I can call and be like, hey, you know what, I'm having this problem. You know, we did this thing. What do you think? Can we come over? Can we run a test? You know, can we check this out? Can we use your microscope? Whatever it is, you know, because um, a lot of small breweries can't afford equipment like that. So, you know, with that being said, like we've developed kind of different set of relationships with them as well. And then you know, and then also too, they help pay the, the electric bill in the. Uh... And I know we also because the other thing too is like we actually get we've developed some of these relationships, so we get to use their wine barrels as well mm -hmm. for barrel aging programs yes. and beers that are more kind of um, you know going to be in cellar for a while. So um, it is a great relationship that way. Yeah, and we and we regularly get a lot of of the wineries that actually are putting wine now in kegs. And they'll come to us and they'll ask us to clean their kegs. So it's a good symbiotic relationship, kind of like helping each other out, which is great. Yeah. Oh, that's great to hear. Uh, my next question is, uh, I, when I was doing a little research for this, I just went on one of the, I forget what website it was, but I just typed in like number of craft breweries in the United States. And like roughly around like 2008, there's a direct upward spike of like, I mean, it's, you know, it, I can't imagine, it was, I forget what the numbers were, but it was, it's a very noticeable spike. And... It lead, led me to wonder: Is uh, you know, is that scary to you? Is that a? Do you think there's a bubble? Is there going to be a chance that there's just too many craft breweries, and eventually, it's going to sat oversaturate the market, and then, you know, eventually it'll go back to the way it was? Or do you think it could keep on this upward trajectory forever? I, I mean, I, I think when we opened up in 2009, there was roughly 1,200 uh, uh, breweries nationwide, and I forget New York's number was probably about 40 or 50, or can't remember exactly. But um, you know now there's over 7,500. There's many more now than there were pre-prohibition. Uh, just last year, I think it was, we surpassed oh, that I number. Oh, it was earlier than that. Or, or maybe it was the year before. Was like 14. Maybe it was the year before yeah. that. But we're so we're um, so there are a tremendous amount. And when we first opened up in 2009, you know we were kind of told by you know smarter minds than ourselves that, well, you know, if you're about 300 miles, you draw a circle around your brewery, you're kind of considered local 300 miles. Well, now today with the number of breweries that are on Long Island and New York City and elsewhere, we find that you're really not really viewed as being a local beer if you're anything less than about 150 miles. So it certainly has changed the, um, you know, the structure of where you think your business may be on some level, but um, I don't. Fi we don't find it uh, scary. We just find it like the more breweries, the better that uh, are making good beer. So long as you're making good beer, that's all that we worry about. Um, so we don't see it as a threat. We just see it as a more of a chorus. I mean, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say. I mean, everyone's probably mostly from Long Island, right? We can all agree on that in this room. Do we think there's too many pizza places here? Domino's still somehow magically it survives. You know, so I don't, I mean, there'll probably be a point where, you know, people who got into this thinking like, oh, this is gonna be a quick buck, this is the cool thing, are gonna be like, oh my God, this is the money pit. 
uh, I got to get out of here now because it's definitely not a cheap business to get into, contrary to what people think. Um, and it's also not like a cash cow where I'm in the back just milking it for hundreds. I wish that was the case. Um, but if you are truly passionate about it and definitely crazy, because um, I think those are two major requirements to get your liquor license, um, you can totally do this, you know, and it's those are the things that are going to keep this going. You know, if you gone into this, you're like, this is an investment, I'm just going to make a quick buck, flip it, do the next thing, you're probably not going to make it. You know, you're not going to want to sustain the the days when you're working 17 hours where a yeast keg explodes and now you're covering head to toe and, you know, all the other fun things or trying to get a half barrel keg down the what used to be basement stairs in the sidewalk, but now it's just a sketchy looking rock wall, you know? There's so much that goes behind this that people don't realize they're getting into. So I think we'll hit a point soon where there's gonna be a little bit of fall off, but I don't think it's gonna be a huge like detrimental thing. And I do think the other, just to go back to what Rich was saying, quality is king. And this has been a thing that the Brewers Association, which is our um, trade group, has been trying to drill into everyone's heads like at our past three years of conferences. Quality is king. Right now there's a lot of people who are new to craft beer. They may or may not know like, oh, this is good. You know, it's like the first time somebody moves to New York and they're like, oh, Domino's, great, I know that. And then they eat like the really good place. They're like, oh, never going back to Domino's again, you know? So it's the same thing. Um, you know, so I feel like what's going to happen is people are going to start to wise up, get more educated, and it's you see this across any market. It's not just ours. It kind of goes with everything. And then there's going to be some people who just don't care. They just want to get drunk or they just want whatever's cheap. And that's fine, too, because those people are going to always have a thing to go to. So I'm not really so worried about the bubble. Uh, I just think there's definitely some people getting into it for the wrong reasons, and it's going to be a tough lesson for them when it, when it all settles. But... Yeah, and I think it, it you know goes back to you know even when Joe, Eric, and I were kind of building a business plan, you know I think a lot of people are getting into it. It's this romantic idea about you know sitting around with your buddies drinking beer, and if that's the reason you're getting into this, this is what you, we do, right? <laughs> this is like twenty four seven. Yeah. Exactly. So you know if you get into it thinking that, that that's what it's like, you're you know it may not fail, but I would almost guarantee that it will because you know. It's just from a professionalism standpoint, listen, this is craft beer and it is part of the industry and that's what makes it so fun about being around people and you know, beer is all about celebration. But if you're not looking at you know, your sales, if it's not a sales or and every, I will say up you know, here, it's kind of, you pick good people because it kind of runs the gamut of size, um, which is great. Everybody has their own business plan and if um, you, know, you stick to that and you know your brand, I mean, I think both you know, Lori and, and Rich up here, they. Uh, you know, really know who they are at their core. And I think a lot of people starting breweries, from what I've seen, they don't know who they are. So why would a consumer, um, you know, latch onto a brand? One, um, you know, going back to quality, if you're not making good beer, it's over. It's not going to last. But also, if you're grasping for straws, you know, trying to figure out who you are while you're trying to build a business, um, I just, you have an uphill battle, um, mm. in my opinion. Absolutely. Mm. You know? I think, too, you know, the other thing that, if you travel, which I'm sure you guys have traveled, but you go to other places like Colorado, and we were down in Tennessee uh, earlier this year for the Craft Brewer, the National Craft Brewers Conference, and you see other states, and they're, the one thing that New York lags on, and, and it's a bit of a quandary and not a certain answer to the question, but the thing that New York lags on is totally embracing the fact that New Yorkers, wherever they go, should be able to be, be drinking New York made beer. And there's a, there's, we're definitely behind the curve, even though New York leads in a lot of other ways throughout the states with our legislation having to do with franchise laws, our Brewer's Bill of Rights, our draft cleaning programs. There are a lot of things that New York leads in in terms of the thought leadership, but the embracing of the fact that if you go to the airport or you go to any kind of major theater location or even hotels and things like that, Often it's hard to find a good lineup of New York made beer. You find the typical Heineken and the other kind of imports. Not that I'm saying they're bad brands. I'm just saying there's not an embracing of you know, what New York breweries are doing. And we are now 400, uh, like 483 four, or something? 483 breweries in New York State. But 10% of those being in Nassau and Suffolk, or actually more, more than 10%, well, just for the record. 
Yeah, you're right. More than 10%. Right? So we, yeah, Long Island is a actually doing a great job in terms of incubating a lot of these uh, breweries. But, you know, so, you know, I think the, 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 uh, the challenge for us as independent craft brewery owners is going to be to continue to kind of um, expose and offer the opportunity for um, New Yorkers to really experience and rejoice in the fact that there's a lot of good beer in New York. And hopefully we'll continue to make progress in that direction. Oh, that's, that, that sounds great. Thanks for answering that. Uh, my next question, you kind of brought it up, all of you mentioned that it, I mean, irrespective of like your quality of your beer, which is you know obviously very important, how much focus do you put on branding of your beer and not you know the not what the beer tastes like but what the cans and the shirts and all that like is that how much of that of your business is like how much you know if you had to split it up percentage wise what would you put it at yeah, for us i mean we're you know I, I know a lot of people know us by the can design when we started uh, obviously quality is number one but when we started putting beer in or when we d made the decision to put beer in cans we wanted something that stood out um you know Rich, you know, said there's, you know, over 7,000 breweries in the U.S. If you go into a Whole Foods in New York City, there's 250 brands in front of you, and you've never had one of them. Why would you pick a six-pack? Um, so we did our research, and we invested in in a, a agency that would help us kind of capture the vibe of Montauk without, you know. And the, the nice thing about um, the agency that we worked with, I was nervous because I, you know, have I handle sales and marketing. I know the brand, I'm born and raised in Montauk, and I didn't want somebody from uh, you know, New York City, not that they would screw it up, but to come out and not be able to mirror the lifestyle of the town and just, quite frankly, screw it up. Um, and I had the exact opposite experience. They came out with a team of people. They stayed with us uh, for about a week and a half, um, interviewed our friends, family, local fishermen, surfers, got a real feel of who we were and kind of where we wanted to go with the brand, and then they came back. Uh, about a month later, we sat in our tap room, and they pinned up about six different versions of their uh, ideas. And I think two of them were throwaways. They were completely just guiding us into the one that they wanted us to pick because um, <laughs> they were terrible. But um, it started with the Yellow X, and I, I didn't bring that tonight, but that's Driftwood, and that was our first beer that we came out with commercially. Um, so our cans are color-coded. It works really well for a lot of different reasons. One, it's simple. It screams Montauk, um, you know, kind of you know, throws back to the nautical flag vibe, bright, welcoming colors. We, you know, we're able to trademark come as you are, and that, um, you know, is a testament to... Did Nirvana have an issue with that, or what? That, oh, <laughs> no, I thought they would. A lot of people think we just listen to a lot of Nirvana, and I, it was more about the... If you've ever been to the tap room uh, in Montauk, um, it was a product of that 100%. I mean, whoever you are, wherever you're from, come to Montauk and celebrate with our beers. Become part of a family. We don't want people coming, drinking the beer, and then forgetting about the experience. And I think that's translated into pretty explosive growth in sales in Manhattan um, because they were able to kind of be part of that family. And I, I consider that part of our brand you know, identity is um, you know, we capture a huge female audience, male audience. Um, you know, the nice thing about the brand is it doesn't just isolate craft beer drinkers. Um, you know, it brings people, it changes palates. And I think, you know, you guys might agree, you know, it's nice when you get a Bud Light drinker who comes in and, you know, oh, I don't like craft beer. They have a stigma of I just don't like it. And they've never had it. And I'm like, well, you know, just try our Pilsner. Try their summer ale. And more often than not, I've had experiences where they hate the beer, but more often than not, um, you know, 98% of the time, they look at me and they're like, what have I been missing out on? And I think that's a testament to the quality and, you know, the, the beer inside the can, but also uh, to pick up a six pack and kind of feel, I, I always call the brand more of a lifestyle brand um, that makes really high quality beer. Um, you know, if you're going hiking, you know, we all surf on the east end. If you go for a surf and then, you know, crack one of these cans, it puts you in a place, and I think that um, we owe a lot of that, um, just kind of the organic branding that we, uh, we were able to, uh, to get in this, you know, can. Yeah. And I know, uh, Rich, I, well, I've been talking before, but he has great drawings from, a, uh, speaking of, a, you know, the local thing, it's the local artist that I went to high school with, and, and do, like, do, how did you get in touch, how did you come up with that stuff? So we're, uh, yeah, so actually I'm holding a bottle of my favorite beer, which is the Other Side IPA. 
Um, and because you can't do these things without a beer in hand, of course. Uh, but we have actually a series of um, labels that were designed by an artist by the name of Scott Bluedorn, amazing illustrator, ink and pen illustrator. I, this is one of my favorite labels because it's a, an illustration of a striped bass on the label. But actually, if you turn the bottle upside down, which I'm not going to do because it's got beer in it, but if you turn it upside down, it's actually also a submarine. So it's really kind of whimsical, really interesting. But um, actually, my wife, uh, who in our original brewery in Greenport, we actually have an art gallery. And she curates um, uh, art shows uh, probably about every quarter with either a local or regional artist that will display their work. So she actually was able to connect with Scott Bluedorn, loved what he was doing uh, with his uh, illustrations. And at that time, we were just getting ready to go into package. So we felt like it was going to be a, a great fit for us. I think it has been. We have about five or six different um, um, you know, styles and labels that we use Scott with, uh, for as well. But you know, our, also, our other um, iconography is, uh, is the badge that has the whale on it. Um, and the whale is our interpretation of what Long Island looks like. So the star is kind of where we're located. When you look at the whale, you can kind of see we're out there on the, on the North Fork, on the East End. And Greenport being much more of a um, kind of a working harbor, it was the place that wasn't kind of have the mysticism of Sag Harbor being kind of where the ships would head out to catch the whale. But if the ships needed to get repaired or fixed or built or whatever, they went to Greenport because that's where really the the hard work was done, so we, um, you know, we kind of celebrate that as well. We we like the authenticity of, um, you know, what Greenport kind of says for us. Um, but I will say that I'm blown away by the the awesome branding that Montauk has, and we are often like those guys knocked it out of the park because it is really spectacular uh, branding. Yeah, yeah. And well, I guess you might as well tell everybody about the mustache a little bit more. Yeah, right? so um, again, as we've addressed, uh, the mustache comes from my husband for years had really big handlebar mustache. So They're awesome. It's an actually, awesome mustache. like when we start, so Matt and I, as I mentioned before, we went to high school together. Uh, we started dating, I was 15 and he was 16. And my parents definitely questioned his age when we started dating because he had a full face of hair. Um, and that was kind of a really weird thing to explain as a 15 year old that no, like my boyfriend's actually not like in his 20s. He, we go to high school together and like year apart. So um, our name really has like aside from his mustache, you know, we didn't have a home, we didn't have a town to attach ourselves to. Uh, we went with mustache, you know, there's not actually like no crazy story behind it. Uh, if you ask Matt, he'll kind of like, all right, it was under my nose the whole time and then like that's the end of the story. Um, <laughs> So yeah, but for us, um, branding is one of those things that we've always been able to have so much fun with. Like we, in the beginning, we um, we actually just we've pretty much done everything on our own. So in the beginning, we really debated. We're like, oh, maybe we can do all of our beers with, like different themed mustaches. Like, and we're like, no, that's actually a, really not a good idea. You know, it's not who we are. You know, and um, you know, so for us, we we just really wanted to have fun with it. Um, you know, for us too, we make so many different beers. Like people are like, oh, how many beers do you have? I'm like, I honestly don't even know. Like, we, you know, we've probably done close to like 200 different beers in the, um, the couple, you know, the four years, we're in our fifth year now that we've been open. Um, we are constantly making something new. So for us, branding is a little bit different than, you know, for you guys, um, because we are constantly putting out something new and constantly, every day is like, Something's on fire and needs to get made. So I actually do um, pretty much all of the artwork for our can. So this is Beyond the Shore, which is actually our first 1% for the Planet beer. Um, so I actually design all of our cans. Um, I love it. I was an art kid growing up and always had like those big dreams, like I'm going to be an artist. But like they forget to tell you in high school that like being an artist doesn't always really pay the bills. You have to get like a real job. So you open a brewery so you can be an artist, basically. Um, so yeah, so for me, it's sometimes it just comes out sometimes I'm just like doing something and I have this great idea for a label and I we Matt and I and our brewing team we just design a beer around it sometimes it works backwards um, sometimes it works forwards where we have a beer and I'm like oh my god please anything get out of my head onto the you know onto a label um, 
But it's fun. It's something that I absolutely love. Um, and it's a very collaborative effort, actually, in our brewery. Um, so if I'm working on a label, all of our team knows. Everyone knows pop into the office or stay away from the office, depending. Um, but you know, there's constant, like, we're constantly, hey, everybody that's sitting yeah, in that little there's, room, there's, there's, there's like a ton of front. seats up here. Yeah. Don't be afraid. <laughs> You're missing out on the good part. We put cans under all the front seats, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Sorry. It was a lure. Um, yeah, so for us, it's just, it's really fun. Um, also, the way we're constantly doing something, it's not financially sustainable for us to really have somebody doing this all the time. Because we did work in the beginning with, um, with a graphic artist to kind of help us set the design and the overall feel of how our labels were going to be. Because sometimes when you're the designer and the client at the same time, it's actually really difficult. It's either you know exactly what you want or you have no idea and you need help. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's us. But for marketing, you know, we work really hard um, on doing all of it ourselves. We have worked with actually a branding consultant in the past year to just help us tighten everything up and really like get our message across in a cleaner way. Um, you know, and I think you do your Instagram too, right? Yeah. So, do you do do you do yep, your Instagram? We, yep, we do Instagram as well. Yeah. Like, do you do it? Or? Oh, oh, every okay. once in a while, they okay. let me post something. Do they let you post? Yeah. Down? Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so that's another big thing is being able to be in the brewery versus like working with like a company that's doing our social media because they're not going to be there 24 seven, you know, catching like, Hey, it's two in the morning and we just finished the brew day guys. We're going to go home and go to sleep, you know? So being able to be the person that's constantly there and constantly involved, like, you know, I think the three breweries up here, we all get to provide this very intimate, um, experience that, you know, if you're on like, the Budweiser Facebook page, like you're not getting that same kind of, you yeah, know. I, I think it, I think it drives to like the uh, the level of authenticity. Yeah. People begin to understand, and you can kind of get that vibe whether it's really kind of phoned in or it's really lived. And I think uh, you know all of us understand and appreciate and have a passion for really living it. So I think that's what works well. I got my, my next question is uh, getting towards the end, and then we're going to open up the floor for questions from the audience, but. I guess uh, we kind of mentioned it already, but if you were stranded on a desert island and you just had <laughs> unlimited cases of your of one of your beers, of one of each of your beers, what beer would it be and why? I'm holding one. He's holding one. All right. <laughs> There's a joke in the brewery that if you see Rich drinking a beer, it's probably an other side IPA. It's a West Coast style IPA, so uh, I love this beer in the sense that it's got a nice malt kind of balance to the hop. It, it is an IPA, an India Pale Ale, so a um, bit more hop forward. But uh, for me, yeah, this would be the nectar of the gods. What about you, Lori? That's a tough one. Uh, which way is the wind blowing? But I'm stranded on a desert island, so I guess, right? Um, I would definitely say Beyond the Shore is one of my favorite beers. I'm drinking so much of it right now. It's a goza. It's an old traditional German style. Um, it's brewed with sea salt and coriander, which some of you might be like, wait, what? There's salt in the beer? It's got like a little tartness to it. It's like refreshingly tart. I love it. I like to call it alcoholic Gatorade. Um, usually I go to the gym in, at some point during the day and then go right back to the brewery and the first thing I do is crack one of these open while I'm just trying to like get myself back together for the rest of the day. It's healthy. It's only 4.9%, uh, so it's a very functional day drinker. Um, <laughs> Listen, you know what? You can't be doing the double IPAs all day. That's no way to get work done. That's a good way to sleep at your desk. Um, and also, if you want to amp it up, sometimes they throw a shot of tequila in it. Don't judge me. But it's like a margarita. <laughs> I have no shame. I really don't. <laughs> and you've That's tough to follow. <laughs> Sorry, Vaughn. <laughs> uh, I actually, uh, the Wave Chaser. Um, kind of similar style to Rich, you know, the other side. Different, very different beers, but um, actually, Eric. Uh, my business partner, our brewmaster, brewed this at very small batches uh, in Montauk for uh, close to a year, dialing it in, putting it on tap to fans through the tap room, and then kind of landed on this recipe. It kind of, it's a hazy IPA. Um, it kind of borderline. My second favorite beer. Appreciate that, I'll take that. <laughs> so it kind of, it's in between that kind of New England style IPA and a, a traditional, uh, or kind of West Coast IPA, 6.4%. Um, you know, it has tons of, People think we put grapefruit in it, you know, we don't put fruit in it. It's the hop varieties that we're using. Uh, four different hop varieties, um, very balanced. It's, uh, it's something that 
Um, you can have a few of and, and not feel it too much. Um, but really just an overall good beer. It's, it sells really well too. And as the sales guy, I, I think it, you know, I like it for that reason as well. Um, I love that beer. And then I guess on the flip side, if you say you're out to dinner somewhere and you don't see, your, you don't see Montauk or you don't see Mustache or you don't see Greenport on tap, what would you order or do you get wine or a cocktail instead? Uh, for myself, um, it really depends. I mean, I have two answers, I guess. Uh, what kind of, I think what got a lot of people into craft beer is Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Um, if I see that, it's kind of a sad thing because you don't see it too often uh, anymore. Um, but um, that beer really got me into it. But overall, it, it depends where I am. You know, if I'm in Greenport, I drink, I love other side. Uh, I'll drink a Greenport. If I'm in Riverhead and I see, uh, you know, mustache, I'll drink that. If I'm near mustache, I'll stop by and pick up cases. Uh, if I'm, you know, in Brooklyn, uh, which I'm in the city a lot uh, with, for business, um, I'm always looking for local, you know, and that's, uh, so I, I think it's not just one brand that I'm, I'm seeking out. It's, you know, even if I've never heard of the, the if I think, you know, I can maybe speak for some people in the room, you know, if you're ever traveling, um, you've never heard of a brewery, but you're in their town, I, you know, it, would be hard to pass that up. It might not be good beer, but at least you've tried. And you know, more often than not, um, you can appreciate something that was brewed, you know, right up the street from you. So I think that's uh, that's kind of what I go for. What I, what's I agree. Local? I, I, it's like for me, it's like uh, where's you know the next New York beer mm -hmm. that's brewed, and then if I don't have a New York beer, what's the next independent brewery beer that that I can find? Um, because I, you know, I just for us, I think understanding what it takes to go into brewing a beer and running a business and putting yourself kind of out there um, for, for other people to judge. Um, you know, that it takes a fair amount of guts to do that and some craziness as long as alcohol. Said. Yeah. Alcohol. <laughs> Always helps, right? <laughs> but yeah, for me, it's definitely New York first. If I can't find, you know, Montauk and, or a mustache um, or a Greenport, then it's going to be what's the next local New York beer that was brewed and why don't you have it? is my kind of second question that I have. Um, and then beyond that, it's going to be an independent brewery. Yep, exactly what these two said. No, and then really worst case scenario, if there's nothing, then it's like if you're at a wedding and it's open bar and they're like, we have Bud, Heineken, I'll have a gin and tonic, please. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but. Yeah, right, exactly. Move to vodka. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for answering my questions, but now, does anybody in the audience have any questions for anyone up here? Oh, you haven't been up on the North Fork lately, have you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or upstate. Sorry, this, I want to make sure everybody heard. I want to repeat the question. She's oh. asking where uh, you get the ingredients or for the beer out here or where, whereabouts mostly. Yeah, so New York used to be, um, pre-Prohibition was the largest hop producer in New York, uh, or in, sorry, not New York, in the entire country. And then um, shortly right before Prohibition, uh, there was a blight. It knocked out pretty much all the hop crops in New York. Then Prohibition happened, so they really need too much of that. New York has actually um, really been up and coming. North Fork is just, uh, there's a new farm that was just put up in Mattituck. We're on the third year, right? Yep, and there are and twenty there are some, some acres, acres now. Twenty is, some acres, yeah. Largest, uh, largest on the largest on the island, yeah, for, sure. for sure. You're not really going to see too much barley on the island. You'll see it more upstate, but uh, Long Island's climate is not very conducive. There's with the amount of rain that we get, it gets a lot. You know, there's a lot of mold issues uh, and mildew, I believe. Yep. I know uh, Melissa and Tony over at uh, Jamesport Farm Brewery. They are, actually, we should probably clarify farm. Do you guys know about the whole New York State Farm Brewery? I just actually want to touch on that because I think it's actually really important. And it does go in terms, actually, I'm going to let you talk about it's it. It's basically, it's, it's, a, it's a, a different license. There's two ca categories. There's microbrewery and then there's farm brewery. Uh, Governor Cuomo, along with Richard Ball, Secretary of Agriculture, came up with a program to hopefully induce and spur greater agriculture uh, in New York State through the craft beverage segment. And so they created this farm brewery designation where uh, up until January 1st, 2019, next year, if you want to be a farm brewery, which give you or gave you certain benefits, you have to use 20%, excluding water, 20% of New York grown ingredients, which would, the majority of that is going to be grain or hops. And so the idea was to kind of reinvigorate that hop 
and grain growing industry in the agricultural sector, mostly of which is going to be upstate because of the value of land and things. But uh, as a farm brewery, then, you know, initially we could serve beer by the pint. We can have five different locations. There were reduced fees that we had to pay for registration of labels and other things. Um, some of those benefits have been expanded to the microbrewery industry across the board. But still, there's still some value to being a farm brewery. And as of January 1st, 2019, it's going to go to 60%. So, I mean, we're, we're a dual license holder. We are as well. You are as well. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, my involvement, I sit on the board of directors for the New York State Brewers Association. And we're trying to um, continue to provide a basis by which we can continue to support the agricultural industry, but also make sure that we're not going to necessarily be handcuffed by some of these rules that, that apply to the farm brewery. And a follow-up. So, she asked, what, what do you do with all their waste products? So we work with local farmers. Um, we pretty much are in contact with them every week. This is our brew schedule. They perpetually are dropping off uh, like big drums. We put all of our spent grain in there, they come pick it up, and their animals eat it. Yeah, and we do the same. We're, we're about 10,000 barrels that we brew uh, on the North Fork. Um, a barrel of beer is 31 gallons, a brewer's barrel. So we, all of our um, spent grain that we you know, have, we have a 20-yard dumpster that's picked up once a week. It gets full to the brim. It's I probably four to 6,000 pounds. Actually, a lot of it comes over here to Amagansett. And we, uh, a farmer over here uses it for composting as well as feeding his animals. But we also um, send a lot of that spent grain to McCall's Vineyard. He has a bunch of cattle. They feed their cattle to it. There's a funny story. When we first started out brewing back in 2009, we didn't want to put this spent grain into the landfill. So we looked around for a place. Where can we get rid of this grain? Well, um, Tushio... Uh, uh, up in Riverhead who, who has um, tweeds, the buffalo bar. She has a, a herd of buffalo on the North Fork. And so this grain doesn't have a tremendous amount of nutrient, but it has a slightly sweet flavor to it. So I call it like the Fruit Loops of grain. And so we would bring it up to the buffalo farm up on the North Fork. And one day it was my turn to kind of drive the, our, our van that had the logo on it, and drive the barrels of grain out to this buffalo farm. Well, the buffalo had learned, amazingly, they saw my truck coming down the street, and it was the most amazing thing to see 200 head of buffalo running to the <laughs> front gate because they knew the Fruit Loops were on the way, you know. It was, it was, pretty, uh, it was pretty amazing. So we, we do that. We also make dog biscuits out of our spent grain, and we have a number of organic chicken farmers that utilize our grain as well. Um, and then we're, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to compost the rest of it. Yeah, so same for us. Uh, every brew day, we, um, it's actually really convenient because we can just fill big uh, buckets. And uh, actually, if you know the martyrs out here, big you know, family out here, Mike actually comes and picks up. And it's all pig feed and compost. Uh, so we really have no, uh, no waste uh, from our brewery, which is nice. Coach Nicoletti? Um, also, one, one raised in Montauk. Yep. Um, obviously. Um, what's the relationship Yeah. Did you guys ever consider putting that on a label? Uh, when we started out, we did. Um, we ended up going with, you can see on the can here, the arrowhead. Uh, that was a throwback to the Montaukett Indians. I like the idea of an artifact. Actually, a, a friend of ours, kind of similar to, he's friends with Scott, uh, Charlie Lee, another local East Ender, designed um, an arrowhead. And, it, uh, you know, we had uh, started from scratch. You know, we didn't have a, a brand yet or anything. So we wanted something... Um, I like the idea of something that you could hold in your hand, something, you know, firm and strong. So the arrowhead worked. We thought about the lighthouse, and a lot of people kind of wanted us to go in that direction, and I, I obviously get it. Um, we didn't want to just, I, I didn't want to be too obvious, I guess. Um, and really, I mean, I love the lighthouse. It's certainly part of Montauk's history. Um, 
but for our, our brand at the time, we kind of just didn't want to go that route. Not yet, but <laughs> There's always tomorrow. we're still new. <laughs> <laughs> any, uh, any other questions? Blue shirt, yes. Uh, it might range for everybody's answer up here. Um, you know, I think uh, actually a, a local, uh, when we were starting out actually before we opened, um, Don Sullivan, who started uh, Southampton Public House, um, he said early on, he was like, stick to your brand, quality beer, and he, was, he brought up Budweiser. And he said, you can, uh, you can knock character, but you can't knock consistency. And for a brewer, you know, I go back and forth because I think it really depends on the brand. If they know who they are and they're allowed to stay on, there's different ways that people, the buyout happens, you know. Um, and I think if the founders stay, the brand stays true to its roots, which I think is becoming increasingly more difficult to do once that happens, um, I think it is possible. I think it's becoming more rare that uh, a brand can really sell and then keep really who they are because it turns corporate. Um, but, you know, a Bud Light in Japan, I'm not a Bud advocate here, but, you know, a Bud Light in Japan is a Bud Light in St. Louis. And, and that's very, we know scale, and it's very difficult to do that at large scale. So, you know, I think beers can get better. Um, it all depends on what the baseline was. If they weren't paying attention to quality before they sold, maybe the beer can be better. Um, the chances of them being bought won't, it aren't too high if the beer was bad first. But, um, you know, I think with labs and access to resources, I think beer can get better. Um, but it really depends on who the, the owners of the, the, the company, you know, the, the company that's bought. It depends on, on who they were before that happened. I think there's, I think there's pros and cons to it uh, because, you know, we, when we first started out, before we actually opened our doors in 2009, we became friends with uh, Pete and Mark from Blue Point. And, um, you know, great guys. And they, you know, taught us the lesson of making sure to pay it forward in terms of any information, any kind of support, any kind of, like, uh, help that they can, you know, offer the smaller guy was the lesson that they taught us because um, they were great with us. And um, so we got to know them pretty well. And certainly then the time came where, you know, Anheuser-Busch bought Blue Point. And, um, you know, for Pete Cotter, it was a bit too much. So he chose to kind of step into the, the background of that whole transition. And Mark uh, Burford, you know, embraced it a bit more and was probably required to be part of that process. But I, I've had a number of nights with Mark at various different functions over second and third scotches where he would say it was unbelievable the level of corporate that something like an Anheuser-Busch brings to a smaller brand. And I do think uh, early on when Anheuser-Busch or you know, some of the larger macro brands, when they would acquire these smaller brands, at first they, they kind of tried to make that smaller brand kind of conform to what their large corporate structure was. I think they're learning now that they need to kind of allow that you know, brand that they purchase to kind of flourish within themselves. But, um, and, and the advantages are, you know, he was telling me, any hop they want is $2.50 a pound. We pay $12.50 a pound for any hop. Um, so the economies of scale that an, a company like Anheuser-Busch affords a brand is pretty tremendous and allows them to be priced way more competitively than we can do it for. So, you know, there are those built-in kind of larger business organization structures that are tough for a smaller brand to compete with. Um, so, you know, we rely upon our nimbleness to be able to um, brew a lot of different things, uh, maybe smaller batches, maybe be more innovative, where you don't necessarily have to pass that idea up five layers of, of approval to get the okay to do it. We can kind of quickly shift and do things that are a lot more kind of like real time than the larger brands. So I do think there are advantages, but I think there's a lot of kind of larger structure that somehow kind of restrains that, 
that entrepreneurial kind of uh, vibe that you have as a smaller brand. Just to echo what you guys both said, there's no way that mustache could survive in that structure. Everything is so like, all right, we got to decide right now, you know. But and just like what you were saying about Vaughn, about the quality, um, you know, with like Bud being the same no matter where you get it. On the the flip side of that, look what happened with the Bourbon County Stout a couple years ago. Um, if you're not familiar, Goose Island out of Chicago um, was very much very known for uh, Bourbon County Stout, which is a phenomenal beer. Um, but probably don't want to buy it because it's owned by the bad guys. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. Um, but yeah, so what happened was this is a beer that people stand online for and wait out every year. The bottles go, you, you know, you can sell them to people if you get them. People are selling them for like 20 bucks for, you know, this size Chicago. bottle, which is kind of crazy. Um, the batch that went out, I forget, was that like two years ago, three years ago? Infected. Like, not like, oh, this doesn't taste right. Like, majorly, majorly infected to the point that there's actually, I don't know if you guys saw this, a huge class action lawsuit. Yeah, because they had to do like a full recall. They were refunding people money. And there's a huge class action lawsuit, actually. It was out like two weeks ago. So... Yeah, there's definitely the benefit of you have all this fancy equipment to use, but there's still clearly issues going on. So I don't know. It's one of those things. I personally, that's a, that's actually. Do you, I don't know if you guys get this a lot. People ask all the time, like, oh, if AB came in and bought you, like, you know, want to buy you? Would you sell? And like, that's a really difficult question. You know, like immediately, I'm always like, I right, just burn it to the ground first. You know, see you later. <laughs> um, but like, if you think about it, right? Like, does anybody own a business in here? Like, is there any other business owners? Okay, so you guys know how much you work and how it feels like some days there's just no end to it. Like, we started, we were in the process of starting the year that Blue Point bought it, got bought out. And it was like a really, for lack of a better term, it was a mind, I'll let you fill in the blank on that. Um, so for us, we were like, we haven't even opened yet. And like, I can't even imagine if somebody was like, hey, Matt and Lori, um, we'd like to buy your company for a very large amount of money you've never seen before. It's kind of a really, like, think about being in that situation, you know, where you're like, I've worked so hard and I'm really tired. And it'd be really nice to just go to Hawaii for like three months and not talk to anybody and like not have to do anything. But then also you're like, but then I'd have to like do thing, you know, sell my company to a company that, is potentially against everything I stand for. So like, imagine putting yourself in that position. It's not like this quick like gut reaction answer. Like, I think too, you're passionate about what you do. Yeah. So if you're passionate about what you do, it's yeah. not you're not necessarily if you're having fun and, and you wake up every day and kind of one of our so because this is a a second career for myself and my partner. Um, I was an attorney. He was in marketing, but we were both beer lovers. And we have this rule that says once it really stops being fun, then we gotta like, you know, decide to kind of consider doing something else. And and we've had some of those days where it's like, is this really still fun? But we always kind of conclude that it is. So I think once you kind of get to that point where, unless you have, um, you know, a succession plan with a younger person coming in or whatever. If you're passionate about it, you're not necessarily looking for anybody knocking on your door to say, hey, um, you know, we'd like to buy your business because you're really having fun. You have an expression. You have something to say. You have something to offer. Um, and so when you're doing that, it's like, you know, that's all you really want to do. All right. Well, <clears throat> I think it's about time. And I know after hearing about all this beer, I'm, I'm definitely thirsty. And I think everybody else is. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming out to the East Hampton Library. And, uh, okay.